Hello and welcome back to Catholic Reboot. This is episode 7. And uh, to begin with, I just want to say this right here, or let me take it out, this right here is the most powerful weapon we can have. You know, I'll have people say, how many guns do you own? I said, I don't. And they say, well, how are you going to protect yourself? I say this right here. Right? And they say, well, aren't you afraid someone will take your life? I said, no, I'm afraid of the devil taking my soul. Okay, so what we're going to talk about um, is the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother. Now, what's important to understand is, again, you'll, you'll notice I'm always in defense of our Catholic doctrine, right? And mostly because um, what I find is that there's a lot of misunderstanding. The most important thing that Catholics... Um, need to understand is that when you see people uh, quoting the Bible uh, verses, uh, first of all, which Bible are they using, okay? Uh, and that's very important, okay? Um, we as Catholics uh, use the Dewey Ream version of the Bible, and uh, many of you know that uh, St. Jerome was credited with uh, translating it uh, from the Greek and the Hebrew uh, manuscripts into Latin, and so the Dewey Ream actually goes back to the uh, to 1582. Um, now, why is that so important? Because when we discuss things like the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother, we uh, words matter, right? They say words matter. Um, a lot of uh, Protestants, uh, Anglicans, Baptists, Evangelists, even Latter-day Saints uh, refer to the King James Version. That's not, uh, we as Catholics do not read the King James Version, right? All right, so let's, let's jump right into uh, the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother. All right, so you'll hear from most Protestants that they'll claim that Mary bore uh, children other than Jesus, all right? Now this is this is uh, this is kind of an affront to us as Catholics, but you have to understand where they're getting that from, right? So I don't think they intentionally have bad intentions. It's just that once again we are theologically trained as Catholics, not biblically trained, because we ourselves understand it takes a, a pretty pretty educated mind to understand what many of these Bible verses are saying. So. In order for the Protestants to uh, support their claim, they refer to biblical passages which men mentions the brethren of the Lord. Um, now, n neither of the gospel accounts nor the early Christians uh, attest to that notion that Mary bore other children besides Jesus. Um, we know that when we, we look at uh, tradition in scripture, that Jesus was Mary's only child and that she remained a lifelong virgin or what we would say perpetual virginity. Now, let's, let's pause right there. Uh, virginity itself uh, used to be very highly praised, right? And you don't have to go that far back. Uh, my mother's generation of women, uh, let's say the 40s, uh, that was very important. It was, um, they viewed uh, the woman's body as the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And where does that come from? That comes from the Blessed Mother, right? Um, parents would raise uh, their daughters uh, in that virtue of remaining a virgin. Even a lot of the kings, when they took a queen as a bride, there was the marital chamber verification that uh, the new queen was a virgin. Why? Because it's virtuous. Um, and women need to hold fast to that. Uh, today, and not to get too negative, it's a joke, right? So uh, young ladies are uh, taught by their mothers uh, to seek out birth control, condoms, and they'll say, well, they're going to do it anyway, and we all remember the great push to put as many condoms in schools as possible, that's a direct affront on your Catholic faith because virginity is very important. Um, so 
let's let's kind of go through how do we know or where is our proof that the Blessed Mother uh, remained a virgin? Yeah, even the Protestants will say no. They they know she was a virgin, but after her job uh, to have the Christ child, there was no longer a need. Well, that's that's just flawed, and and theologically it's flawed. So uh, there is uh, uh, was a very famous uh, patristic uh, scholar named Johannes uh, Quasten, and. Uh, the term uh, patronistic is, uh, it was a branch of Christian uh, theologists that uh, dealt with the lives and the, the writings and the doctrines of the early Christian theology. So you'd say the specialists in the deep dive, so to speak. Now, uh, what Johannes said is the principal aim of the whole writing of James, right? Because this is where they're getting that, that term brethren. Um, and it was actually referred to as proto uh, of James, right? Long word. Um, was to pr prove the perpetual and inviolated virginity of Mary before and after Jesus' birth. And there's actually um, in the Petra. Pet Paterology, paterology, tough word. Um, one uh, dash one twenty. They they are very specific as to how they know that, right? So uh, to begin with, the uh, proto vacuum records uh, said about the Mary's birth was prophesied. Okay, and once again, very important that in. Uh, the Old Testament, that there was reference to the Blessed Mother. Now, Mary's mother was Anne, right? We call Saint Anne. And uh, Saint Anne herself vowed that she would devote uh, her child to the service of God. Now, that was, that was something that was, wasn't all that uncommon at the time. Right? Father, um, Mary was uh, meant to serve the Lord at the temple, okay? So as a woman had for centuries, uh, as uh, Anna, which they refer to as the prophetess, did at the time of Jesus' birth, right? Um, uh, it was considered a life of continual devoted servants to the Lord at the temple, so that meant that Mary would not be able to live the ordinary life of a child-rearing mother. Now, on today's standards, they'll say, well, that's just not natural, right? Uh, actually, it's quite the opposite. It is a dedication, and it was, a, it was a great privilege for a woman to be raised with the idea that she would live her life for God through the vow of lifelong a perpetual virginity. So the reason this is important is when, when non-Catholics say, well, she had no reason to, well, what they don't understand is that she had already made this commitment uh, before uh, the angel announced that she would uh, have the Christ child. So this, this whole decision was uh, before that. Um, they, they referred to it uh, as the certain considerations of ceremonial cleanliness. Uh, so when we look at that, what was very important to understand is that when a woman was consecrated to be a virgin for God, uh, they always had a guardian or a protector for that woman to respect her vow of virginity, right? So, according to the uh, Prote Vanglium, uh, Joseph, um, the husband of Mary, uh, was an elderly widower. And most people don't know that, that St. Joseph uh, was married before and his wife had died. And he already had children. Um, and so what happened is when they looked for this protector, they were looking for someone uh, of great stature and honor, okay? And I had referred to this before in the, the flight to Egypt 
that Joseph had to be very concerned when he's going on dangerous roads at that time uh, to safeguard Mary's virginity because there was a lot of robberies and rapes and you imagine what was going on at the time, right? So Joseph, as her, uh, her protecting spouse, um, this also explains, if you would think, Joseph was much older. And I, I think I had the age... Uh, at the time of the birth of Christ, I think he was in his late 60s or 70. Um, and you imagine the Blessed Mother was uh, was 16, year, 16 years old, something like that. So huge age difference. Um, and this also explains why by the time Christ di started his uh, ministry, um, uh, Joseph was already dead. Right? He was already gone at that time. So... Um, you won't, since Mary was entrusted with Joseph as her protector, Joseph was regarded uh, was regarded as the protector or uh, the protector for Mary's virginity with the utmost respect. Right. So the the gravity of this responsibility Joseph had was almost as like a guardian, right. Uh, over the Blessed Mother. And so uh, when, when the temple authorities wanted to be certain, they would actually refer to Joseph. He was not only her protector, but he, he vowed for her, right? Um, now, when Mary was accused of having forsaken God by break, uh, breaking her vow, right? So we all remember that when Joseph discovered that Mary was with child, it's not only that he was shocked by the fact she was pregnant, which was highly unusual at that time, but it also uh, was a reflection that he didn't do his job, right? That's why the, the archangel had to inform him that her pregnancy was of the Holy Ghost and not of man. All right, so now when we talk about the perpetual virginity of Mary, it's, it's always been somewhat reconciled uh, with the biblical references to Christ's brethren through a proper understanding of that word. So that's why when we, we talk about the right Bible, the Dewey Reams Bible, um, the term brethren uh, would have referred to Jesus' stepbrothers. That's kind of awkward for us as Catholics to to imagine that uh, Jesus had stepbrothers, but those would have been the children of Joseph. So rather than half-brothers, uh, as it would be if they were children of Mary, right? So it was uh, the most uh, common uh, until the time of Jerome in the 4th century that when Jerome was was doing the translation from the Greek and the Hebrew to the to the Bible in Latin, uh, he was first uh, somewhat introduced to this possibility that Christ's brethren were actually his cousins, since in the Jewish idiom, cousins were also referred to as brethren, right? So the, the Catholic Church uh, allows the faithful to hold either view, right? So since both are compatible with the reality of Mary's perpetual virginity, um, it, it, it doesn't really much matter if that would have been cousins or uh, stepbrothers uh, to Joseph, right? But um, today, most Protestants are unaware of the, those earlier beliefs regarding Mary's virginity and the proper interpretation of the brother brethren of the Lord. And, uh, and yet the Protestant reformers such as Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, honored the perpetual virginity of Mary and recognized it as a teaching of the Bible, uh, and which is somewhat surprising that uh, they even held fast to that, right? It's this, this more modern Protestantism is when this came about. And I, I remember it coming out about 10 years ago, all of a sudden they started using this as a way to disregard the Blessed Mother. And uh, again, I, I refer to the aim 
of non-Catholics to do this is to bring Mary down because they feel we elevate her too much. So this was a great way to, uh, to kind of put Mary in her place, right? So um, what we need to understand that um, when Mary uh, was in, had actually entered the temple, you know, we'll hear this in the, um, in the Joyful Mysteries, right? The presentation of the Christ child in the temple. There's a transition here, right? Because she was really beholden to be the virgin for God uh, and to be at the temple. And now there's this change. She is the virgin actually presenting God in the form of uh, Jesus, right? Um, so it's, it's really interesting how this works together very well. Now, uh, knowing that, uh, we, we also want to understand that what the priest had said, right? And, and the priest had said, Mary, why have you done this? And why would you have brought your soul low and forgotten the, lo uh, the Lord your God? And Mary wept bitterly, saying, As the Lord my God lives, I am pure before him and not and not man. Now, so there's no misunderstanding, okay? This isn't um, the priest uh, who, who said, uh, thank you for uh, presenting Christ, and now I can pretty much die, right? Because he, he had asked God for the favor to actually hold the Messiah. This is a, another priest who, when he heard that she was pregnant, right? So, uh, you know, this has never been referred to as one of Mary's uh, seven sorrows because they really don't start until after Christ is born. But if there is a prelude to a sorrow Mary had, it would have been that the priest at the temple uh, had somewhat rebuked her. She was supposed to stay virginal for God, okay? Uh, and that's why when we discuss the Magnificat, that was Mary's exaltation after uh, knowing that uh, the Holy Spirit had overshadowed her, and now she's exalting, right? So um, what I want to what I want to emphasize here is if we if we didn't protect this understanding of Mary's perpetual virginity as Catholics then once again we're going down that slippery slope of giving away one of our deposits of faith. And you'll hear some Catholics say, oh, does it really matter? Yes, it matters a lot, okay? It's a fundamental belief uh, for us as Catholics. And it also erodes um, the Blessed Mother as a mediatrix, which is basically what non-Catholics uh, try to do. All right, so I don't, I don't mean to uh, overstate the importance, but, you know, one of the, one of the earlier schisms that, that happened between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church is the Orthodox were, go, were starting to go down the road that um, man was not really born uh, in original sin, but that because of uh, Adam and Eve's fall, the world became sinful, okay? And they masterfully worded that uh, to make it seem as if that was not that significant of a, uh, an issue or uh, a departure from the deposit of faith. Well, here again is where it gets to be a slippery slope. If they believed that, then there would have been no reason that Mary would have uh, uh, been required to be born immaculate right? Uh, or what we refer to as the Immaculate Conception. I bring that up because we've got to be careful that we don't let these small slights enter into our faith, and we got to protect our doctrine and our deposit of faith, right? So we believe that God uh, was born of a virgin because we read it so, well, we do not believe that Mary was married after she brought forth her son because we do not read it that way. Once again, I'm going back to the accuracy of the scriptures. Um, 
So um, I think I think I've explained that as best I, I can. Um, the next part of this, so it, there's two pieces to the importance of perpetual virginity, uh, and that is if Mary was was the Immaculate Conception, and she was not of original sin, and she sustained the virginity, which if she had not, she would have basically fallen into a state of sin, right? Uh, then when we look at the ending, which is her assumption into heaven, uh, it, it will fall apart, right? Because what do we know of the assumption of the Blessed Mother? She was assumed body and soul, right, uh, into heaven. And what, what's, what they would say is she fell into a deep sleep, which means she could not die because that would mean that uh, she was corruptible. Uh, she w was not corruptible. So she basically uh, was assumed um, by God into heaven and uh, therefore then be, became the official uh, matrix uh, uh, a co-redeemer, as we say, um, uh, for us Catholics. Now, if, if we believe that, okay, so we believe in the perpetual virginity, we believe in the assumption of the Blessed Mother into heaven, then we, we look at the co-redeemer. Now, this is another big problem for uh, non-Catholics. They'll say, how can Mary, a human being, be put at the same level as Jesus as a, redemp a redemptive power. Because by the very nature her soul was pure, she is not at the level of Christ, but she assists Christ in man's redemption. And that's why when we hear it said that when Christ was on the cross uh, dying, he said uh, to John, behold thy mother, and to Mary, Mary, behold thy son. He wasn't saying, John, take care of Mary, and Mary, take care of John. Uh, although there was some of that, uh, uh, that actually did take place later on. John did look after Mary. But what he was saying is, you know, behold the mother, and every, every kingdom has uh, a matriarch, a, a, a motherly presence over that, right? The queen, right? So Mary is considered the, cre the queen over the Catholic Church. And when many people will say there's all these patron saints, patron saint for eyes and uh, the blessed sacraments and hearing and health, why wasn't Mary ever uh, given a uh, patron over anything? And she actually was. She is the patron saint over the Catholic Church. She basically through her virginity brought Christ into the world and Christ then did what? He created the church, right? And this is why we defend the church. No matter what happens, all the scandals uh, that, that have gone on for the last 2,000 years, we say that this is Christ's church uh, because of its human element. It's corruptible, but will never be totally corrupted. And we also know that God, uh, Christ will never abandon his church. He may let it uh, get pretty low. He may even allow the devil to attack it viciously, but he will never abandon it because both him and the Blessed Mother are overseeing the Catholic Church. Okay. All right. Now, uh, St. Augustine had written... Uh, in 401 AD uh, about the Holy Virginity. And he said, in being born of a virgin who chose to remain a virgin even before she knew who was to be born of her, right? This goes back to what I was saying before. Saint Anne had already promised to the temple that they would raise her, their daughter uh, in a state of perpetual virginity, right? So Christ wanted to approve the virginity rather than to impose it, right? And he wanted virginity to be a free choice. Because the Blessed Mother was human, she still had the right of free choice. It's almost like the seraphim angels. 
uh, but they are so close to God that they they couldn't go against their nature, right? Much with uh, the blessed Mon blessed mother's choice of remaining a virgin, even though she had the free choice, she she remained uh, with that decision. So uh, Saint Augustine said, and and Christ wanted the virginity to be of free choice, even in that woman in whom he took upon himself the form of a slave. Okay. So um, it, it's important to understand that even the early uh, theologians of the church, which St. Augustine was, that was rooted in, in the deposit of faith. Now, um, there's also a, a separate sermon on this uh, in uh, 411 AD, and it was, it was not the visible sun but it's invisible creator who consecrated this day for us when the virgin mother fertile of womb and integral in her virginity brought him forth made visible for us by whom when he was invisible she too was created a virgin conceiving a virgin bearing a virgin pregnant a virgin bringing forth a virginal perpetual so, uh, once again, it's, it's uh, part of our deposit of faith, and we, we must uh, remain with it. There were heresies around this. Um, uh, there was, um, and this would have been in 428 AD, uh, a heretic, a group of heretics called the uh, Anti-Decamorates, anti morates I'll put that on there so you can see how that's spelled, are those who contradict the perpetual virginity of Mary and affirm that after Christ was born, she was joined as one with her husband. Okay, and we understand what they mean by uh, she was joined with one. All right, so this, uh, the early church uh, would always come out against a heresy and correct a heresy. Uh, what's kind of troubling is I don't see a lot of current um, uh, priests when when this matter comes up uh, that will will defend it enough, right? Uh, it seems like uh, the the Catholic Church today wants to go along to get along, but they should really come out very hard against this idea that the Blessed Mother was not a virgin. So uh, in this series, uh, what what I want to be able to do is just say, okay. We know what perpetual virginity is. We know where it was uh, written. We know where it was protected. And therefore, it leads right to our assumption. You can't have this without having this, right? So, um, again, I hope this helped. And um, if you have any specific questions about this, I'll put up my email address. And uh, you can... You can uh, write me or email me if I didn't explain this well enough or if you would like to challenge this, right? So uh, God bless and uh, see you in the next episode.